Good morning, everyone. I'm Tamika Ralnagan, the Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, and I'm delighted to see all of you uh, here today. I'm so pleased to welcome you to uh, the Radcliffe Symposium focused on the critical and urgent topic of human gene editing. Now, I say urgent because we find ourselves in a new scientific era, an era that demands thoughtful analysis of our capabilities and of their potential implications, both positive and negative. The technology to make very precise genetic changes is far more accurate and more accessible today than ever before. And technical acronyms like CRISPR now pop up regularly in the news and even in conversation, not just in science journals and on syllabi. Yet it's fair to say that the underlying concepts and the practical realities of gene editing aren't common knowledge. I'm delighted that the Radcliffe Institute is hosting this forum, one in which we'll explore crucial nuances as we consider the scientific, ethical, social, and legal implications surrounding human genome editing. In true Radcliffe forum, form, we'll do so by engaging with scholars and practitioners across disciplinary and professional boundaries. It's only by drawing on diverse perspectives that we can understand the scientific, medical, and ethical implications of the new capabilities and begin to answer questions like, what are the important distinctions between gene editing techniques, some of which produce heritable changes while others do not? Where are the gray areas, the unknowns in human genome editing as an area of research and applied science? What are the benefits and trade-offs in clinical applications? And as we move forward in this new era, what does consensus on standards for research and clinical care look like? Now, I'm not a scientist. I'm really not a scientist, as many of you know. I'm a law professor and historian. Yet, as the dean of Harvard's Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, I embrace the responsibility of institutions of higher education to foster informed dialogue around issues with important societal implications. Gene editing and its applications in medicine and scientific research is clearly one of those issues. It is a scholarly and a decidedly public matter, and today's program will address both of these facets. Before I turn things over to Professor Immaculata de Vivo, I'd like to offer some thanks. First, I'm grateful to our provost, Alan Garber, who encouraged uh, Radcliffe to take on this critically important and timely topic. I'm also grateful to our planning committee, led by Professor DeVivo, uh, thank you, and to, and to all of the committee members, including Associate Provost for Science, Kathleen Buckley, Professor Janet Rich Edwards, and Professor Alyssa Goodman. Thanks as well, as always, to the Institute staff, especially the Academic Ventures team led by Becky Wasserman and the events team led by Jessica Vicklin for all of their hard work behind the scenes. And of course, we're honored to be joined by a distinguished group of panelists and moderators. Thank you all for being here. Finally, I want to acknowledge the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and all of our annual donors. You enable the Institute's work. Thank you. For, for your support. With that, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Immaculado de Vivo. Mac, as we call her, is the Life Sciences Advisor here at Radcliffe, a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a professor of epidemiology at the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health. She also directs the Genotyping and, and Genetics for Population Sciences Core Facility at the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center. Please join me in giving Mac a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dean brown uh, Colleagues, participants, attendees, everyone watching live stream, uh, I am pleased to have the honor and responsibility of shepherding uh, this timely topic. So how, you may ask, did this symposium come into being? 
It started when, truly, the provost contacted the dean uh, wanting to engage Radcliffe to host a symposium of this topic. Given that the topic of gene editing, broadly, has captured the imagination of the scientific community as well as the public, Radcliffe is well positioned to showcase this event. Because the magic, I like to call, of Radcliffe Institute is their ability to bring together a multidisciplinary approach to topics, and as such, today's program design is within that spirit. Scientists, clinicians, ethicists, journalists, and all have come together here to explore this topic. Gene editing, broadly and specifically CRISPR, we have constructed a timeline which captures the milestone of the, the development of CRISPR. And right now, I'd like to take you through a few of them. So there are just a few. The, the, the larger, more comprehensive timeline is on the website. I uh, urge you to go to the website at the end to uh, uh, click through. But today, um, just for the framing remarks, I'm going to uh, give you the timeline. A uh, few milestones. So the timeline was written for an expert audience, and I will do my best to translate it to the non-expert audience. Um, and basically, the timeline illustrates the stride over the past few years that have been enormous, from the discovery of these little repeats of DNA in bacteria to the implementation of CRISPR into clinical trials. Truly remarkable. So with that, I'd like to take you through this uh, timeline. So how did we get to today? These repeats and um, these are bits of DNA that are repetitive that were found originally in bacteria. It's a primitive immune system in bacteria, to be, to be exact. It is a simple yet powerful tool to change your DNA sequence, to modify gene function. It has enormous implications from clinical to basic science, to even improving crops. So these selected milestones, again, I will translate in a non-expert way in the best of my ability. And this is a very characteristic display of uh, CRISPR, uh, what it means, and I will try to take you through some of these cartoons within the little time that I have. So in 1987, uh, these repeated sequences were recognized by Yoshino in E. coli, which is the bacteria. And Mojica in Spain actually coined the word CRISPR. Boletin discovered the Cas9 protein, which is actually the scissor that everyone uh, equates with uh, CRISPR. This scissor is critical, as you'll see with further discoveries, and it was Horvath uh, in his discoveries that showed that in actuality, the bacteria, when it's invaded by a virus, which is called a phage, it is, um, it's their, the bacteria's way of sort of digesting, for lack of a better word, the, the virus, because it's trying to attack. This, ergo, is the immune system. And of course, it was Sylvain, who's one of our speakers today, who showed that the scissor cuts with, with precision, great precision. He will talk about that today, hopefully. And the, one of the more uh, profound discoveries within CRISPR was by Charpentier and uh, Doudna and colleagues, where they show that with the use of these um, guiding RNAs, Okay, they can direct the scissor to cut exactly where they want it. So they were able to take the system out of nature and into the lab, so to speak, to engineer. It rendered it a programmable system. Huge implications. And of course, Zheng Feng uh, showed this in humans. And then of course today, where we are actually using this technology in clinical trials for something like sickle cell anemia. Truly remarkable, uh, in, in th 30 years we've gone from this discovery of these weird looking repeats in bacteria to the implementation in clinical trials. And as a researcher, um, I can't contain my own enthusiasm how it's quite remarkable. And it's partly 
or mostly because the entire world came together to work on this technology from all aspects, whether it was the acknowledgement or the recognition of bacteria to the uh, discovery of the scissor to how the scissor cuts and where it cuts and how do you pro manipulate it. So it's truly a, a multidisciplinary discovery and implementation in the clinical setting. And so with that, I would like to introduce the first session, which is on science and society. And uh, for the sessions today, the way we have designed them is that they're case studies, and then we will have um, a, uh, a famous uh, Sharon Begley, the journalist, at the end to do sort of a round table discussion with the moderators. I will introduce each moderator and do a brief bio and the, mo and, and the speakers for the session, and the moderator will then introduce each speaker with their bios to give, the, to give the session talk. So the first moderator for today is Charmaine Royale, and the speakers within that session are Sylvain Montu and Jonathan Kimmelman. Can you please come up? So you can put this right here, and the guys can sit. So Charmaine Royale is an Associate Professor of African American uh, Studies, Biology, Global Health, and Family Medicine and Community Health at Duke University. She also has appointments uh, at the Duke Initiative for Science and Society and at the Kennan Institute of Ethics. If I were to read you the bios of all these uh, distinguished speakers, we'd have three days of bios. So I will show um, deference by just giving you uh, a few lines. So with that, Charmaine, I give you the podium. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. I'd like to thank Mac and Becky and Rebecca and everybody, <laughs> Tomiko and everyone, for inviting me as well as, as the other speakers to this, to this um, timely, timely event. Um, this first session, Science and Society, I think sets the tone for the entire day um, because we're going to talk, our speakers are going to talk about the scientific aspects of CRISPR and the ethical and social implications of, and policy implications of CRISPR. And then we'll have the case studies later on that allow us to incorporate what we get from this session into those discussions. So Mac presented a, a, a wonderful timeline in terms of, of CRISPR and how we're coming to think about CRISPR and the, and the evolution of the technology. But I'd take us back even further in time. I'd take us back to 1953 when Watson, Crick, Franklin, and Wilkins told us about DNA and introduced us to the structure of DNA. And it's soon after that that people started thinking, OK, if we can figure out the exact changes in the genome, well, now we call it the genome, then they didn't call it the genome, the exact changes that, called, that cause disease, then we should be able to target those changes and, and fix them, right? And, and, and cure disease. And the idea of, of gene therapy, let's start with gene therapy, gene transfer, because CRISPR is just a variation on the same thing. It's fixing the problem in the genome to, 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 to cure disease. And, and so gene therapy, the idea of gene therapy, which we eventually started calling gene transfer, uh, came about in about the 1970s, 1972 or thereabout. And later on, we had the first successful studies in, in, in the 1980s, 1990. We had the first successful gene transfer trial for SCID, severe combined immunodeficiency, with, with, with De Silva, um, who, who was cured then. So we had gene therapy, 1990. And then in 1999, everybody knows what happened. In 1999, we had Jesse Gelsinger, with the first reported death from a gene therapy trial raised a lot of issues, a lot of questions about this, this, this procedure and, 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 and the way we do it and, and, and the ethical and social implications. And that put a halt on gene therapy for a while, but the work was still going on. And, and fast forward to, 19, to 2012 and, and, and CRISPR and now our conversations about, about, about this technology. But the ideas, the fundamental ideas have been there for a long time. And the issues have been there too. Germline versus somatic, right? Disease versus traits. Issues of equity, the rich versus the poor, who has access? 
all of those issues. Some are old and some are new, and we're going to talk about some, some new ones today. So I, I applaud um, Mac and, and her colleagues for bringing us together, science and society, recognizing the need for us to think about the scientific agenda in the, con in the context of society. And I know our audience here comprises people who are scientists, who know a lot about this, but people who are from the broader community who are trying to understand. I'll, I'll, I'll tell a short story. Last week, I was at the American Society of Human Genetics. The American Society of Human Genetics is the largest professional organization of gen human geneticists worldwide. And some of my colleagues, Vance and Kiran, were there. And the final day, the final session of the American Society of Human Geneticists, I mean, there's 8,000 members in this society. And, 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 and we were talking about what's on the horizon for genetics, for human genetics, and Kieran moderated that session. And one of the panelists, Cynthia Morton, who's here at Harvard, told of, uh, of her, a ride she was having in a taxi cab. And, and the cab driver asked her what she did. She's a geneticist, a human geneticist here. Asked her what she did, and she said, I'm a human geneticist. And he said, oh, are you involved in that gene sniper thing? <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and I thought that was precious. That just goes to show that it's out there. It's out there. And people under, and he's, he's right, it's a sniper thing, right? Um, people understand this in all kinds of ways. And so today, I look forward to our conversations today as we think about the scientific and the ethical and social implications of, of genetic gene editing. So I'm going to introduce our speakers. And I'm just going to read their short bios in the program. And as Mac indicated, you have the longer bio there. So our first speaker, who's going to talk a bit about the science behind all of this, is Sylvain Moineau, Canada Research Chair in Bacteriophages in the Department of Biochemistry, Microbiology, and Bioinformatics in the Faculty of Science and Engineering at the University of Laval in Quebec. Thank Sylvain. you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Royal, Jermaine. I certainly want to thank uh, the organizing committee. I want to thank Dean Brown, agent, for the invitation. I want to thank Mac, Professor Vio, for the invitation as well. Always a pleasure to come back to Boston. So yes, I am at Université Laval. A lot of people actually last night asked me where this is. Well, this is in Quebec City. Uh, this is a French-speaking university, so of course I'm going to give my talk in French. Um, no, I won't. Um, so it's about 40,000 students, and I, I hope you're going to take the time to visit our lovely city of Quebec City in Canada. So today I'm going to talk to you about a bit of the history. So my talk will be separated in two parts. The first part will be a little journey in microbiology, and the second part will be, well, why you're here. All right, we'll talk about the gene editing technology. As Mac mentioned, what a ride. Um, CRISPR has been crazy. Uh, there's a lot of front newspapers, but also in scientific journals. You know, scientific journals with one word are usually pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, so they made the front page of those as well. Um, and, and of course, you, you are all here. This is the, usually the first slide I start when I give a talk on CRISPR. Uh, when I talk to my students, uh, I, I showed this slide and I told them, you know, this is um, if you type CRISPR in the, in the art, research article databases, uh, this is the number of publications that are related to CRISPR. So as uh, Mac mentioned, the acronym started in 2002, and she showed you the timeline, and the technology appeared in 2012, and, and today we're almost over 6,000 articles on CRISPR per year. Um, so that's about 16 papers per day. Uh, you can't keep up with the literature, it's insane. Um, so this is a career opportunity. Uh, <laughs> some people in the audience could say it's a business opportunity. Um, so there's a lot of people involved and interested in, in this technology. So today, I, I guess my take home mission is right there. There's two things. There's a CRISPR-Cas system that you're going to find in bacteria. And there's a CRISPR-Cas9 technology, which is the tool that we're trying to use for genome editing. And if today I'm going to try to show the differences between the two. Uh, and, and of course, by explaining a little bit where CRISPR-Cas came from in bacteria, uh, it's going to lead to the technology itself. 
That's okay. Well, don't have a choice anyway. Um, so this is a single tiny drop of water that you see on the right here. That drop of water was mixed with a DNA binding agent. So what you see here, the little dots here, the little ones are viruses. The big dots are bacteria in the single tiny drop of ocean. So if you go to the harbor in Boston, you take a little water, you'll find this. What it means is that we are surrounded not only by bacteria, but we're surrounded by viruses, all right? Viruses are the most abundant biological entities on the planet. It's not bacteria. We're full of bacteria, by the way, 40 trillions of bacteria in our body, 40 trillions. There's more viruses in our body, all right? So we're surrounded by viruses. These bacteria, because they're surrounded by viruses, they need to defend themselves. Otherwise, they are going to die. So they need defense mechanism. They need an immune-like system. Otherwise, they'll die and the viruses will win. So what they, these viruses do in our environment, they actually control the population of bacteria. And these viruses are called bacteriophages, meaning eating bacteria, all right? So we're surrounded by those, and bacteria are surrounded by those. So they have a really key role in our environment because that's one of the reasons we don't have piles of bacteria. They're, they're killing those, those bacteria. So this is a very small schematic representation of how these viruses replicate. <clears throat> so there's a, <clears throat> sorry, there's a big difference between a virus and a bacteria. Bacteria is a cell, so it replicates by itself. It's got all the machinery to replicate. So if it's got a good condition, nutrients, the cells will become two, four, eight, 16, and so forth. A virus cannot do that. A virus needs a cell to replicate. A virus by itself cannot do anything, so it's inert, except when it's inside the cell. That's different. All right, so the phage and viruses need the cell to replicate. So that's a little schematic here of how viruses or phage replicate in that case. So they will absorb to the cell surface, they will introduce their DNA inside the cell, then at that time they take over the cell to produce new variants, new viruses. And this cycle, or lytic cycle we call, takes about half an hour to do so. Oh, it's very fast, so they can kill bacteria very rapidly, all right? They're like the Usain Bolt of virology, all right? They're really fast. They can kill your cells, right? So of course, bacteria, they need to defend, like I just said, and they've got multiple defense mechanisms. I mean, really many of those, and many more need to be discovered, by the way. So they can block this replication of viruses in multiple ways. And CRISPR-Cas is actually one of them, all right? There's many more, but today we're focusing, obviously, on CRISPR-Cas, and its function uh, was discovered in 2007, as Mac was mentioning earlier, uh, in publication with Philippe Orvat, and my group is also involved in this finding because we're studying phages and we have interest in how bacteria are defending. So we already uh, presented the acronym, which was published in 2002. Actually, in the literature, there was a bunch of acronyms that were proposed for this structure, uh, but CRISPR was the one that, that stuck. So it's cluster, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats, all together now. <laughs> no, um, and, and there's also CAS for uh, CRISPR-associated genes or proteins, all right? So and we'll uh, talk about this just a little bit. So this is your typical DNA sequences, four letters all mixed up and gives us genes and gives us what we are today. <clears throat> so if you go into a, some bacterial genomes, you'll find this. You'll find this. You'll find these repeat sequences. It's the same letters next to each other. And they are separated by variable regions, like Mac was mentioning, these are spacers or variable regions. So this is what CRISPR is. It's found inside of about half of the bacteria have a CRISPR, the other half does not. But that's what it is. It's repeats and variable regions, and so forth. And in the literature, in the press, it's often uh, presented that way, with color coded. So you've got the black diamonds here, which are the repeats. They repeat, so they're repeated. And between them, you've got variable sequence, and here they're, they're shown by rectangle, different colors, because they repeat, the spacers are actually different. <clears throat> so this is, again, inside the genome of a bacteria. If you go next to that region, you'll find genes, again, in the bacteria. And what a mess it is. There's a bunch of different genes, Cas1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth. There's a lot of different Cas proteins that have been associated with these CRISPR structures I'm talking to you about. 
And really today we're going to talk about this one. CRISPR-Cas9 is, Cas is found in one type of CRISPR-Cas system. And that's why sometimes in the journals or in the literature or in the press, you'll find another story about another CRISPR because scientists are studying this one. They're studying this one. They're studying this one because we don't know how they all work, right? So there's a bunch of bacteria as a, as a highly diverse CRISPR-Cas system. All right, so study, a lot of scientists are actually studying these things. It's kind of nice there's such a diversity, so you avoid to be, to be scooped by other groups, but that's part of science. <clears throat> um, so CRISPR-Cas in bacteria, and I'm going really briefly here, works in, two diff in three ways. So the first step is called an adaptation or a vaccine step. So the phage will infect the cell, but the CRISPR machinery will pick part of the, bank, or the phage genome, or the virus genome, and will introduce it into its CRISPR array, if you can believe that. It will just introduce a piece of the viral genome into the CRISPR array. At that time, there will be some RNA, so GPS that will be produced. This RNA molecule will be produced that will be matching what has been introduced into the CRISPR array. And then the Cas9 protein will bind to this GPS molecule and be inside the cell. If so if another virus comes in, it has a perfect matching sequences from this and this, it will bind to it and it will cut the DNA of the virus. So this is how it works in bacteria. And I've got this educational video just to illustrate what I'm trying to say here. <clears throat> so this is a bacteria having fun, multiplying. This is actually in a cheese environment or a milk fermentation process. So you've got bacteria that we're using to make cheese. It is infected by a virus, by a phage. Its DNA gets inside the cell, as I was trying to tell you. And then at that time, that's the end of the cell. The bacteria is done. The virus wins because it's going to produce itself, protein, self-assemble. And after half an hour, the cell will blow up. And the cell will be, and new variants will be released into the environment, ready to infect other cells. And that's nature. That's happening in water, in yourself, and so forth. Sometimes, when a defective virus, so a virus that's not very efficient, gets inside the cell, the CRISPR will pick part of its genome, introduce it in, it in its array, in the CRISPR array, and then at that time start mounting its immune system, producing this RNA molecule, this GPS, producing that Cas9 protein, by, bind together, and waiting for another cell, to come, another cell to be infected by the phage, will be recognized by the machinery, and the phage, whoops, oh, uh, it's a virus, there you go. Um, I wish. Uh, so, so this is ca this big blog here, this is your scissor, your Cas9 protein, your sniper. And it is actually armed with this little RNA molecule. And this is what we call really a GPS. Because you can modify that RNA molecule to go and bind to another part of the genome. All right, and that's why it became a tool, because you can modify that GPS. Unfortunately, this is a GPS. It doesn't go always where we want it to go, but that's the point, all right? And at that time, when the DNA of the virus is cut, the, DNA, the virus cannot repair itself. It's done, the cell win, all right? So it's a defense mechanism. Have you ate yogurt today? Not yet. I hope you did, because it's good for you. Well, if you did, you actually ate Cas9 because this is found in yogurt bacteria. This is natural. This is a way that the bacteria were using to make cheese, to make yogurt. You see, when you look at the ingredients, you'll see bacterial cultures. They carry a CRISPR-Cas system. All right, so this is a natural process. The technology now, CRISPR-Cas9. I don't know, I'll finish with that. So this is a very, very powerful research tool, and never forget that. Because today we want to talk about uh, medical application. But this CRISPR-Cas9 is a fantastic, very successful research tool. A lot of people in, the, in, uh, in various bio, uh, life science labs are using it with massive amount of success. We're making discoveries, new discoveries, because we're using CRISPR-Cas9 as a research tool. Of course, because it's a research tool so successful, people are trying to see now, all right, can we move this from a lab and try maybe to cure people. But if we succeed or not, at the end of the day, it's still a very, very powerful uh, research tool, okay? So what's the technology itself? We took part, or scientists took part 
of the natural system to develop this tool. So they took Cas9. So you remember the, there was a bunch of protein, bunch of RNA molecule there, but we took just part of it, the Cas9 and this little GPS to form this Cas9 and this GPS together. Again, remember, we can change this as, at will. We can de determine where we're going to bind to a piece of DNA. And this technology, as Mac was mentioning, was actually published for the first time in 2012. It was a collaboration between Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. Um, this was published in August 2012, all right? You see the number of citation. Um, and then Fang Zhang and George Church Lab here in Boston uh, published uh, two papers showing, in, in a few months later, showing that this can work in, in cell lines, in human cell lines, animal cell lines. Again, August, February. This is the number, this is a very short list of organisms that have been modified using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. Look at the dates. I mean, this technology was rapidly adapted because it's so easy to use, right? Every, pretty much everything has been modified using CRISPR. There's difficulties in some cases, of course, but it's been really uh, useful. This is another uh, video, educational video, to show how it works. This is from MIT, that with their, where their um, uh, permission, we have modified it a little bit for educational purposes. You go inside the nucleus of a human cell or a cell. This is DNA. You can introduce Cas9 arm with the GPS that you want. It will bind to one strand of the DNA. There's a little motif that is necessary. And then Cas9 will cut the DNA, the DNA you want. Then, then at that point, you will rely on the cell to repair itself because the cell can repair itself when you see a break like that. Then if you introduce at the same time another piece of DNA with little tricks here, you can actually introduce it where you want that piece of DNA. You can also introduce a mutation, correct a mutation, and voila. This is as simple as, as I, well, not really, but it, it, <laughs> it's close, it's close, all right? So again, this is a very powerful research tool because if you sequence the genome of, let's say, a plant, a human, you analyze the genome, you quickly realize there's a number of proteins and genes we do not know what they do. Now we have a tool where you can go and modify that gene, modify that protein, and look at what's, the happen what's happening to the cell when you do so. So we're understanding the function of these proteins now, which is fantastic. But of course, like I was trying to say earlier, there's medical applications. And you can use CRISPR-Cas9 technology in at least three different ways. We might heard of a few more today. Um, ex vivo, in vivo, or gemline. So ex vivo is pretty simple. You need the consent of the patient. You will take maybe some cell, immune cells most of the time from the patient. You're going to introduce your editing system. And then you're going to check if it's got that, it cut or replaced at the right spot, and then reintroduce that into your patient. So this is called ex vivo somatic editing therapy. There's certain clinical trials ongoing. A lot of people are, a lot of people, scientists are looking into that if you could modify some immune cell to attack cancer cells. So we take cells from the patient, modify it, return it into the patient. So that's called ex vivo somatic editing. So like uh, Mac mentioned, there's a couple of clinical trials that are underway uh, in the United States. In vivo now, in vivo is that we want to modify you. All right, you've got a genetic disease, you've got something you want to correct, you might be blind for something, you might be blind. So you can take, there's some um, vehicles where you can introduce Cas9, you can introduce the GPS into the, these viral particles, and these viral particles will be sent to your body, targeting the area where we want to modify and try to mutate. So, some cells, not all of your body, but some cells will actually be modified and hopefully having a positive impact. And again, there's some clinical trials ongoing. There's one at least that started uh, in July 2019. In this particular case, they want to treat some form of blindness. All right, so they're going to inject the virus containing Cas9, uh, a viral vehicle, should I say, with carrying Cas9 in the GPS into the behind your retina and, and try to modify some photoreceptor cells and maybe have a correct the blindness. And finally, um, yeah, in vitro gemline editing medicine. And it's very obviously, we're gonna talk about this today where we're deliberately, deliberately changing the genes 
and pass on to our children in the future generation, should we do that or not? So essentially, it's in vitro fertilization, you get your fertilized egg, you introduce your CRISPR-Cas system, check it has the right modification or not, grow the cells, and return it, the embryos to the woman. We're probably gonna discuss that today. Uh, um, and there are many applications where I talk to you about CRISPR-Cas9, but there's also Cas12, Cas13, Cas14. Last week, there's prime editing now. Uh, there's many more new technologies. I mean, it's insane. Again, 16 papers a day. Um, really crazy. So in conclusion, I, wanna, I hope what I tried to say is that viruses are abundant. Uh, you're full of viruses. Um, CRISPR-Cas is a natural defense system that bacteria are using. You eat this stuff. If you eat yogurt, you eat cheese. It's highly diverse. Uh, it works in three-step in bacteria. We took parts of, these, of this natural system make it, to make it a tool, a genome editing tool. Uh, and maybe it has great potential in medicine and definitely in agriculture. And you're going to see that in your foods way faster than you'll see medical application. And on that, I certainly want to thank our CRISPR team in my group. So you see the list of all the people that have been involved in the CRISPR uh, Cas9 uh, technology, and maybe highlight Josiane Garneau who was on the paper that showed that, CRISP, that Cas9 and CRISPR Cas system was cutting the DNA at a very specific uh, spot. You know, so our collaborators at DuPont and Nisco, I do not have any stock on DuPont and Denisco, uh, but our collaborators for a long time. And I want to thank Yannick Doyon, who provided me some slides uh, for my talk uh, today. Uh, yes, we are working on CRISPR-Cas, but we are a phage lab. Uh, so I certainly want to thank our, uh, all the people on my team right now uh, working on, on phage and on CRISPR. And I certainly want to highlight uh, here Denise Tremblay, which is uh, in charge of our phage collection, because we do have at the Université Laval in Quebec City a very large phage collections that allow us, allow us to, uh, to play around uh, these, uh, with these bacteria and these viruses. And of course, all our funding agencies. And of course, I'll be here all day. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvain. Our next speaker is Jonathan Kimmelman, James McGill Professor and Director of the Biomedical Ethics Unit in the Department of Social Studies of Medicine at McGill University. Thanks very much. So uh, nice to have the other uh, aspect of Quebec represented here. Uh, McGill's an Anglophone institution. I'm going to be speaking in English today. Uh, I always joke that in, in, if you live in Quebec, uh, the orchestra concerts you go to are twice as long because after they do the French horn solos, they need to do the English horn solos. Anyway, uh, OK, good. So let's get started. Um, so probably a lot of people here in the audience are familiar with this story. Uh, Mila Makovec, who is, was a six-year-old kid who uh, was diagnosed with Batten disease, a very rare uh, aggressive uh, neurodegenerative disorder, uh, invariably fatal. And uh, shortly after uh, her diagnosis, uh, it was discovered that she had a particular mutation uh, uh, in one of the genes called CLIN7 uh, that interrupted the proper splicing of this sequence, leading to the development of her Batten disease. Within a very short period of time, the scientists that, were, that had diagnosed her condition, as well as a group of scientists here at Harvard, uh, Tim Yu's lab, were able to identify the exact genetic sequence and develop an oligonucleotide sequence that could disrupt that glitch and enable proper splicing of that CLEN7 gene in order to produce a properly functioning CLEN7 gene product. So within the span of about a year and uh, a year or so, there was a, they went all the way from diagnosis through to testing an, a small genetic sequence, an oligonucleotide, in rats. And then within two months of that, they were already putting this oligonucleotide sequence into the spinal cord of this patient in order to uh, control or manage her Batten disease. So this was reported widely in the press. Uh, just recently, about two weeks ago, it was the actual results were published in New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, although on a lot of measures, you don't hear about this as much in the press reports, on a lot of measures, there wasn't really too much of a change in Mila's symptoms. There was maybe some 
you know, uh, interruption of the decline of some function, but there was still some decline uh, in function. There was, uh, in fact, a dramatic decrease, objectively measured, in the frequency and duration of her seizures, and that decreased in lockstep with the increase in dosage of the oligonucleotide sequence. So this is a bit of a window, in a way, into the future of using uh, gene editing. Now, obviously, this is not a gene editing technique exactly, but it's very similar. It has a lot of properties that are really similar to this. And in fact, uh, oligonucleotide sequences are analogous to the guide RNAs that would be used in a CRISPR-Cas9 system. So I want to use this case, in a way, uh, to motivate some of what I think are some important limitations and policy concerns associated with uh, the application of gene editing uh, in uh, medical context. My talk's gonna divide into four different sections. First, I wanna talk about some of the expected impact, medical impact of these techniques. I wanna argue actually that uh, far from having completely revolutionizing medicine, I think that their impact is gonna be relatively modest. There, there will be, to be sure, an impact, but it'll be an impact in niche areas. Secondly, I wanna suggest that there will be important challenges in terms of definitively establishing the safety and efficacy of these different techniques. And thirdly, and related to that, that will also create major challenges in terms of ensuring equitable access to these various approaches. In the last part, I wanna talk a little bit about sort of why I think these concerns, uh, ought, uh, why they matter uh, morally. Okay, so let's start with expected impact. Uh, so uh, we've already heard a bit here about some of the projected impact of these various techniques. It's not hard to find headlines that proclaim a completely transformed medicine by using gene editing approaches. I wanna sort of cloud this picture a little bit and provide some context for some of these claims. I think there are three reasons to, to uh, why the impact of these techniques in medicine may be smaller than we might think at this point. The first has to do with the incredibly long timelines. Developing products in medicine takes a really, really long time, partly because the science is just so complex. And as anyone here knows from basic economics, there's this phenomenon called discounting. Uh, a dollar today is worth less than a dollar 20 years down the line. And so that means that if we're gonna think about the value of these interventions, we have to think about this in the context of it taking many, many years to go from a basic concept, from exciting science into an actual clinical application. So we can look at gene therapy or gene transfer uh, as a window into how long those timelines can be. There's been a sort of recurrent theme so far that uh, things go really, really quickly in CRISPR-Cas9, but we haven't yet really talked about how slowly things go in the context of clinical development. Uh, so for gene therapy or gene transfer, the very first trial was in 1989. It wasn't really until uh, 2017, about 28 years, that you had the very first licensed, FDA licensed product uh, for gene transfer. If you look in, at a particular disorder, hemophilia, this was always considered the low-hanging fruit for developing a validated gene transfer technique in human beings for various reasons. First clinical trial, uh, 1993, uh, but actually the first trial really showing some efficacy doesn't happen until 2017, 2018. I'm told that we're on the cusp of an FDA approval of a hemophilia gene transfer product. So again, we're talking about 27 years of uh, period of germination for this technique, lots of time. Now that sort of interfaces with my second point, which is if we wanna think about the value and impact, we have to think about this in an incremental way, the way economists think about increment. So, as I said, we have about 25 years from the first hemophilia gene transfer study into an intervention that looks like it's effect effective for hemophilia. And so it's tempting if we wanna think about the value to look at how much value we're getting today compared with the way we managed hemophilia back in the early 1990s. But of course, during that period of germination, there were a lot of other research lines that were progressing. For example, there's a long half-life factor replacement therapy that made tremendous advances in this period. There are monoclonal antibodies that basically mimic the effect of factor, uh, factors and uh, uh, some very promising findings in New England Journal of Medicine in 2016. Uh, and then uh, 2017, uh, uh, an RNA uh, inhibitory uh, approach for managing hemophilia A as well. So again, we have these various parallel research trajectories that are non-gene transfer that are happening at the same time. And so if we really wanna think about the value and impact of gene transfer for hemophilia, we need to actually measure that against where we are with these other rival techniques. And it's actually a bit smaller than it would be if we were comparing it back to the benchmark of where we were with hemophilia back in the early 1990s. 
Now, the third phenomenon I want to talk about here that limits the value of these approaches has to do with the narrowing eligibility. When you develop an intervention, at first you have it in your mind that it's going to be used for everyone with this particular condition, but through the process of clinical development, gradually various populations fall by the wayside because they're ineligible for that approach. So let's just go with hemophilia again, Venn diagram, all the hemophilia patients in the world that will be candidates for gene therapy. Right off the bat, we can eliminate children given the current techniques that we use for gene transfer. They can't really be used in children because of the particular liver physiology of children. At least right now, they can't be. Now, on top of that, we have to eliminate patients from uh, low-income countries, middle-income countries, uh, who aren't going to be able to afford hemophilia gene transfer, at least in the foreseeable future. And then we have to eliminate patients who have neutralizing antibodies to the viral vectors that are used to deliver the gene transfer approach. And then we also have to eliminate people who have inhibitors uh, to the factor that's produced by the vector. And so at the end of the day, you're left with a smaller population than you might have envisioned uh, that's going to be eligible for this technique. And that's a general theme one sees in innovation. So bottom line in this section, I just want to say that for sure there will be an impact, a really important impact. There will be transformation in niche areas. But at the end of the day, a fairly modest impact against all the other innovation that we have elsewhere in medicine. My second point has to do with evidence. I think there are two reasons why collecting really good evidence about safety and efficacy will be particularly challenging in an era of precision medicine, of, use, of gene editing. The first is a fairly obvious point, which is that when we're talking about population, precision medicine, we're talking about very small populations. Now, most of us here probably know that the gold standard for establishing the relationship between getting a drug and its safety and efficacy is the randomized control trial. Now, randomized control trials are premised on there being a large enough population to be able to accrue into a trial so that you can eliminate or control the effects of random variation in a population and really get a good measure of the treatment, uh, the cause and effect relationship between a treatment and a disease response. When you start moving into niche areas like precision medicine, you're taking that large population and dividing it into really, really fine grain strata. Now you have a problem of actually populating trials in order to run those kinds of randomized control trials. That's a challenge not only for measuring efficacy of these interventions, it's also a challenge for measuring safety. This is a really humbling slide here. It's a lot of information. All you need to know, uh, imagine you have a, a new medical intervention and it increases your risk of cardiac mortality by about one out of 1,000. And cardiac mortality is already happening in the population at about six out of 1,000. So your increase is going from six out of 1,000 to seven by taking this drug. You would need a clinical trial that would enroll about 160,000 patients in order to detect that a level of increased elevation. So the bottom line, even for licensed products, non-precision medicine, drugs that are used in large populations, it's incredibly difficult. You need large populations to be able to really detect uh, uh, safety, uh, subtle safety signals. That's going to be a major challenge in an area where you're talking about tiny populations that are going to be taking highly uh, pers personalized interventions. And on top of that, in order to be able to up your statistical power in that setting, typically you have to use surrogate endpoints. These are indirect measures of disease response. In cancer, for example, tumor shrinkage is a surrogate endpoint for what we really care about in medicine, which is survival. Well, those are imperfect measures. Oftentimes, surrogate endpoints don't really give an accurate read on whether there's actual meaningful clinical benefit. And again, it's a device that we use to up our statistical power at the cost of really being able to make certain and confident inferences that a treatment is effective. My third point has to do with access. Now, of course, everyone here probably is aware that many of these interventions are likely to be expensive. We worry about whether people are going to be able to access these interventions. But I want you to think about this in a somewhat broader context. If we have a healthcare system that, is, uh, that has a finite size. It means that if we are going to afford these expensive interventions, it means we have to cut back on other interventions or the access to other interventions. So it's not merely about who can get access to these techniques. It's also a question about at what cost, at what, at what we're going to have to restrict in a finite system of healthcare resources in order to enable those patients to have access. And I think there are three reasons why we can expect major challenges here. Uh, the first has to do with the fact that, we're again, we're talking about precision medicine products. These are highly customized. Number one, if a company is developing a product for a really, really niche market, a small market, it needs to charge a lot, uh, a very high price in order to recoup its development expenses. 
So that's number one. Number two, if you have a bespoke product, it means you can't necessarily mass produce it and gain those economies of scale of mass production. Now on top of that, because you have interventions that are developed for niche areas, you also have less competition in that economic space. And you know, in principle, at least competition at least is supposed to be good for bringing prices down. Doesn't always work that way, but it's, that's, what it's, that's how it's supposed to work. On top of that, there are major challenges for healthcare systems that uh, relate to the fact that these interventions that we're talking about are one-time expenses that occur at one point in a disease trajectory. So normally, when healthcare systems are reimbursing for uh, a treatment, it's over the life cycle of a treatment. You take a drug chronically, you know, blood pressure medication chronically, and the cost is spread out across that life cycle, but also whatever cost gains for that insurance system or the payer are gained across that life cycle. So if you have a one-time intervention, even if in principle that one-time intervention is cheaper across the entire life cycle than these other interventions that are a little bit less effective, it creates really big challenges for payers because they have to front that money, a substantial amount of money, up front, and they never know whether or not that person is going to remain in the system long enough for that system to accrue whatever cost savings are going to occur from that treatment. So think about this. I think you know, we both live in Quebec. We've got a wonderful healthcare system. Don't let anyone tell you uh, it's, it's not. Um, <laughs> and uh, so you know, if uh, someone gets gene therapy in Quebec, uh, I can tell you we also pay high taxes there. I help to pay for that. Um, uh, that person goes off to live in the United States, it means that our Quebec healthcare system is not accruing the cost savings of having delivered that gene transfer approach. Now on top of that, in order for us to even estimate the costs, cost savings of these interventions, we need to have really good evidence of the long-term benefit. How long after you introduce gene therapy into the liver does the liver continue to produce enough factor replacement to actually correct the hemophilia? It may take many years for us to actually have a sense of what the actual trajectory is in terms, or the durability is of those interventions. Oftentimes the cost estimates are based on assumptions that are really not very well evidence-based about how long these are gonna last. Because of course we'd have to wait five or 10 years or 20 years to actually measure those things. So this is just, uh, just to close this section out, just to mention the cost of some of the products, at least in old school gene therapy, not uh, gene editing. Uh, if we look, at, for example, at this product for, developed for uh, a condition for, called LPL deficiency, was licensed in Europe. The cost of this product was about 1.1 million euros. I'll let you do the conversion to US dollars. Uh, this is a product here that probably people have heard of. It's a CAR-T therapy for acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, here the cost is about $475,000 uh, for, uh, for a complete treatment. That doesn't include the ancillary costs of the uh, medical costs of managing a patient who's taking uh, this intervention, substantial cost there. Uh, and then here's another, here's the second uh, licensed gene therapy product. It's a treatment for a rare uh, hereditary form of uh, uh, blindness called LCA deficiency. And uh, this treatment costs about 470, or is it 400, $435,000 per eye. So again, a substantial cost. Now let me sort of close off this section uh, by talking about a couple reasons why I sort of think it's important to consider all these issues about access, uh, impact, uh, evidence, et cetera, uh, in the context of gene editing. The first is that there are tremendous pressures on our regulatory systems around the world, but especially here in the United States, to lower, about, to lower some of the standards for licensing products because there is so much hope and expectation about these interventions being effective. I think it's really important that we have some context for assessing the impact of these interventions before we acquiesce to these demands to lower regulatory standards. In fact, if we are going to actually accrue those cost savings and accrue value for healthcare systems, it's crucial that we have really good evidence of efficacy and safety before they actually go out onto the market. Number two, I think it's important for us to remember that as exciting as CRISPR-Cas9 is, amazing stuff to be done, it's important to keep other research initiatives going along in parallel. Again, think about that incremental value. There's lots of other value that we're accruing uh, through other kinds of techniques as well. Thirdly, a little bit counterintuitive here, I just wanna underscore a lot of times people, when they talk about CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, they have in mind all these sort of scary scenarios of you know, 
customized babies, you know, uh, designer babies, and you know, uh, people, you know, enhancing their intelligence, etc. I think again, if you think about how long the development timelines are and how difficult it is to accrue really, really good evidence, I think some of those kinds of scenarios are things I worry a lot less about. I'm much more worried about issues of access and the quality of evidence. Let me just close really quickly uh, with a coda going back to the case of Mila Makovic, uh, which is what I uh, started with uh, originally. So in this case, first let's think about the expected impact. Uh, clearly this it seems, suggests that this had an impact on the, her illness trajectory. But again, there are other development programs uh, for batten disease, uh, numerous interesting development programs. In fact, New England Journal of Medicine 2018 published a really important clinical trial about enzyme replacement therapy, a kind of an old school technique for uh, managing uh, genetic disorders. So uh, not, you know, CRISPR, or at least in this case, oligonucleotide therapy, not the only dog in the race here uh, in terms of managing these kinds of disorders. Number two, let's talk about the evidence challenges here. We have one case study uh, amidst who knows how large the forest is of other case studies. Now, because case, negative case studies are never published in the medical literature, we don't really have a sense of what the success rate is and even how reliable necessarily this particular success is. Is it a fluke or is it actually real? We don't really know in part because, you know, again, as I said, we don't really know how large that ocean is of other case efforts to try to bring about remission of similar kinds of conditions. With respect to the access, uh, my understanding is that the oligosense uh, antinucleotide uh, research effort for this patient cost somewhere on the order of $3 million that was raised through a GoFundMe campaign. So again, this is not an intervention that most people are going to be able to access. And, uh, and with respect to issues about why it matters, let me just note some of the different rules that we normally have for drug development that were suspended or that were under considerable pressure in this particular case. And I'm not knocking the case. Uh, I just think it's important for us to consider some of the context of this case. Number one, we had a very abbreviated period of toxicology testing, basically a month and a half of testing a product that is supposed to be used chronically in this patient. Uh, number two, normally with clinical trials, we are obligated to prospectively register them before publication. To my knowledge, this is the second time New England Journal of Medicine has ever published the results of a clinical trial without any prospective registration. Um, it's a little bit ambiguous whether this should have been registered or not, but I'm just saying here's a case where the rules about registration are kind of a little bit under pressure. And number three, think about the normal mechanism by which we prioritize research, uh, scientific research. Scientists are scarce resources. We really want to make sure that we allocate that scarce resource towards the most productive social ends. In this case, you don't really have a proper peer review system that is allocating research effort. What you have is a, Go front, a GoFundMe campaign and a scientist willing to work with that funding. Now, again, I don't, I don't wanna, I'm not completely knocking this case. I just think these are issues that we ought to consider. And so I'll just close by uh, saying that, um, that uh, uh, I think there are uh, tremendous promise of using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing in many areas of medicine. Uh, but I do think that it's important for us to be thinking about some of the cost issues. And I think it's probably much more realistic that we think about these having impacts in particular niche areas. They will have big impacts in those niche areas, but I'm not sure how generalizable this will be across other areas of medicine. Thanks. Thank you. So thank you both. Now we, we're gonna have a conversation here. And you can, you're just going to listen in on our conversation. Um, and then we'll open the floor for questions, OK? Uh, so thank you both, Sylvain and, and Jonathan. As I listened to both of you, I, I, I kept thinking the hope and the hype, right? And, and how we balance those things. Um, so, so Jonathan, you talked a bit about the long timelines uh, for impact. And, and I wanted to hear your take on that, Sylvain, in terms of We've seen what's happened with gene therapy, gene transfer, and how long it has taken um, for us to get to FDA-approved uh, products. Um, what is your sense on, on, on what will happen with, with CRISPR um, or with gene editing? Let me be broad. Gene editing in terms of how long it will take for us to get to a point um, where we can you know, think of this as being ready to go and even talking about safety 
uh, as Jonathan uh, mentioned. Want to go first? This time? Oh yeah, you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I something I, I try to say is that CRISPR-Cas9 is already a success. Okay. It's already been used in research, and there. Are new drugs that are being developed because we use CRISPR-Cas9 to understand how the human cells are working. Um, so from a research perspective, using the technology, for me, it's already a clear 100% success because we know more about the human body or human cells today that we knew five years ago, all right? So for me, it's already, it's a given. Um, now, how can we translate that research knowledge and using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology um, to um, treat people and, and have um, safety issues and all that. That's why the clinical trials are, are, are ongoing. There's are only a few of them ongoing, but they're ongoing here. And, um, and when I don't know the answer, usually I stop here <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, I really don't know. Hopefully it's gonna work in some cases, but for sure, and that's why sometimes when people are calling for uh, like to stop any research or any use of the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, I, I really hope it's never going to stop being used in research mm -hmm. because again, it's a tremendous, tremendous research tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, add, add something really quickly to that. So I think it's helpful to distinguish between this as a research tool versus as an intervention. So as a research tool, you know, again, I talked about these different parallel development trajectories. This is a research tool that will help those other parallel research trajectories. So, you know, it, it may very well speed any number of different applications, not all of which are direct applications of this in human beings. When it comes to direct applications in human beings, uh, you know, I, I think about this just, you know, who knows what the percentage is, but 90% of the time when you have really, really novel platforms, it takes decades to go from basic concept into application. We look at angiogenesis inhibition, you know, 25 years, monoclonal antibodies, you know, similar amount of time, gene transfer, any number of areas. So it takes, it generally takes a really, really long time to go. It's not like with computers where, you know, we have Moore's law. Biological systems are just so much more complex. Humans are hard to control. There's so much variation, et cetera. Um, but having said that, I said that 90% of the time it takes a long time. I don't know, 10% of the time you get really quick, quick wins or maybe 5% of the time. I don't know what the percent is, so I, don't, I wouldn't rule it out. We have to think in terms of probabilities. Yeah, because I guess my question should not have been how long you think it's going to take. I think it's more a question of do you think this will give, have a shorter tagline than, than gene transfer, for example, given that we know more and, and the technology is quite different. Um, uh, yeah, well, let me, let, I, I can, I'll say something about that really quickly. Um, so I study a little bit of this in, in more sort of small molecule context, not so much. Um, mm -hmm. But you have, this, you have this sort of funny thing going on uh, in, in science and therapeutic development. So we, we're learning more and more. We're coming, becoming more and more clever. We have different kinds of tools to get at different problems. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, things should be getting quicker. But that's always offset by the fact that we've solved the low-hanging fruit problems and that we're getting to more and more difficult problems. Mm -hmm. And so we're constantly sort of at this tension between getting smarter in dealing with more and more difficult problems. Now, where exactly the equilibrium ends up, I don't know exactly, uh, but, I, but I think that you know, we should not lose sight of the fact that our cleverness is always competing against our solving easier problems mm -hmm. or moving on to harder problems. Indeed. So, Vaughn, what do you think is the bottleneck or could be the bottlenecks in the technology and and, and the advancement of the, of the technology. Um, you mean for human applications? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, there's a lot of discussion about um, is it going to cut or modify at the right, right place, what mm -hmm. we call the off-target issues. And it's been, it's much better than it used to be. Um, so, people, so essentially when the RNA, I mean the, the GPS, uh, you hope it's going to go and cut the right piece of DNA uh, and it's going to be re replacing or you're going to modify what you, what you hope for. And, and we have seen that in, in you, when you do this in viruses or you do that in bacteria, most of the time you get what you want. But when you do this experiment in a much bigger genome like our genomes, it, it doesn't always go and cut at the right place. So there's, that's a huge issue. Mm -hmm. uh, in the research, as a research tool, 
you, of course, if you do this experiment in your lab and you've got, we've got the tools to see if it cuts out of the right place, right? Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't cut at the right place, you just you throw the plant away or you throw the, the cell line away. You can't do that with a human, obviously. Uh, so that's really a big issue, and it's getting better, but it's not 100%. And where is going to be um, the cutoff? I, I, that's going to be that's definitely a bottleneck for sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, and also it, it's interesting because there's also all this area. It's not uh, human medicines, but there's a lot of uh, research going on in agriculture. Uh, can we use this technology, for example, to improve? I mean, we're nine million, nine billion people. Do we need to feed this this planet, right? Uh, and can we improve on on all the all the agricultural uh, crops? And so, CRISPR has obviously been used a lot. But then you get into uh, countries that see this GMO use differently, like in Europe or in Canada uh, or here in the United States, which is a bit different. Um, so, I, I was trying to say in my talk is that for sure, CRISPR has already been uh, been used in, in crops, and it's going to be much better than what we used to be doing. Um, will people embrace that or not? It'll be interesting. So it's like a GMO uh, debate again, uh, with with more information, faster technology. So that's also in. Um, yeah, we can discuss later about this as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Any response there, Jonathan? Uh, no, I think I think uh, so. Then captured. Yeah, thanks. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about precision medicine. So Jonathan, you brought that up quite a bit, and um, there are varying perspectives on what precision medicine is and what it's not. And the way you presented it, 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 it was presented as it's all about the genome. The way the NIH has presented it is that it's looking at genes and environment and behavior and looking at those variables that come together. And, and for, for us to be able to to treat and cure and prevent disease based on our knowledge of all of these factors and how they interact, not, not just the genome. Many people interpret it to be just the genome, and that's part of the hype, right, is, is that it's all about the genes. And so you talked about the fact that precision medicine, as, as conceptualized around the genome, will, will primarily around the genome, will cause us to to the impact to be limited to small populations, right? But the way the All of Us program here in the U.S. and the Precision Medicine Initiative in the U.S. is framed, it's about all of us. It's about all of us. So it's ta we're talking small populations, but we're also talking the population um, as a whole. So do you think, what do you think of that critique of, of, of gene editing technology as being limited to just a select few or a small populations versus the way I think NIH and, and others are thinking about, about it, whether they're doing the work that's gonna get us there is a whole nother question, but the way they're thinking about it as, as being applicable to, to our broader society and larger, larger populations, not just a select few. Um, hmm, I'm trying to think of how to respond. I mean, I, to, to be honest, I don't really even know what the term precision medicine means, although I've tried to study this, you know, I've, I've, I study precision medicine, uh, but it just seems like people use this term in so many different ways and are, you know, I've heard people say that having a Y chromosome is a, you know, Y chromosomes are biomarkers. I, you know, I suppose that's true in some sense. The, the, the version of precision medicine that I have in mind is the version that you see implemented in cancer. And of course, the aspiration is to be able to take a patient's tumor and type it and be able to match a drug uh, or match a treatment regimen based on whatever markers. Now, it turns out that there are, at this point at least, uh, a limited pool of markers that we can match people to drugs, but the aspiration eventually is to be able to take 100% of cancer patients, you know, type their you know, tumor. And so there is an as you know, and, and then de determine the treatment regimen based on that. So there's an aspiration, obviously, to reach large populations. But again, at the end of the day, if you are talking about taking a population of lung cancer patients and breaking them up into splinters of patients with BRAF mutations and you know, KRAS mutations, EGFR amplification, et cetera, et cetera, again, you're talking about having smaller populations in which to validate your particular management strategy. And I just don't see, I mean, if you think about the very concept of precision, 
you know, I just don't see any way around the fact that you're talking about having fewer patients in which to understand how an intervention works. Okay. Let me hear Sylvan has a response to that. I don't know. <laughs> I, no, you're talking about, um, you, about NIH. And, um, and, and I think what personalized medicine, I think um, what you, you want is to have uh, therapies that will, yes, will be personalized, but also applicable to other people, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think you definitely need to, I'm sorry to say that, but you definitely need more funding for basic <laughs> research. And I think uh, every, I mean, of course I'm biased here, um, <laughs> but we do need that funding to increase increase our knowledge and, and try to make it, yes, personalized medicine, but to be available to more, to many diseases and to many people. And, I, and, and that's why there's a hype. Mm -hmm. There's a hype because as a scientist, when you find something interesting, you talk about it, you're passionate about it, you want to tell people, this is cool, this, is, right. this may work. <laughs> and then you need to tell our, our elected official, hey, look what we, did, what we did with the funding you got, but we need to go further. And so that's why there's a hype. Mm -hmm. And there's a hype because we're really passionate and then we know we can go further if the funding is there. Mm -hmm. I know it's a cliche, right? But it's so true, it is so true. Yes, and of course the hope piece is that we want to give people hope. There are lots of families uh, um, suffering with individuals suffering from devastating diseases, genetic diseases, monogenic diseases that could benefit from the technology. So, so the balance is, I think, what we're going to be talking about all day today, really. It's, it, it's how we, we balance those things. Um, we have just a couple minutes for our discussion, and I wanted to, to, to wrap up our conversation by talking a little bit about, about access. Jonathan, you mentioned access, and that is a very important um, part of the conversation that often gets left out. Um, and, uh, but you know, recently, it's, it's interesting that we're having this now, this conversation here now, the, the, this symposium here today, because just recently, the NIH and the Bill Gates Foundation announced that they're gonna be working together to bring some of these technologies to Africa, looking at sickle cell disease, which we're gonna hear about in a little bit, um, and HIV. So, so they're addressing the access issues. What's the problem? I mean, we, we, we've got Bill Gates on board, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we don't have to worry about that, do we, Jonathan? <laughs> I know that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> I, I, I think you've answered it yourself. I mean, you know, obviously, uh, you know, the Gates Foundation and many other initiatives have you know, transformed access to tuberculosis medications, vaccines, uh, HIV management regimens. So, so there has been, you know, back in, the, back in the 90s when AZT was, you know, first being developed, there was a lot of discussion about whether or not we should run clinical trials in low-income countries. And many people objected because they thought uh, there's no way these countries are going to be able to afford AZT. But actually, at the end of the day, partly because of the positive results on those trials, NGOs were able to bring enough pressure to bear on pharmaceutical companies and governments to actually lower the cost to make them affordable. So, so you know, even though your question is rhetorical, I do think there is some promise. There are certainly some areas where we have been able to increase access. Uh, whether that's universalizable outside of neglected and highly prevalent diseases, to me, is a really, really big question. I'm not sure I see that happening in the context of gene transfer, bone marrow transplant, et cetera. So, Vaughn, you've got the last word. Oh, well, <laughs> access is obviously key there, but we're still at the beginning of all this. Mm -hmm. And the first clinical trial started this year. They were approved last year, but they started this year. There's only a few patients that are starting to be treated, so we're a long way to go. So, yes, there's hype. It's a very powerful technology in the lab. Can we, uh, is it going to be safe? Um, probably, maybe, I hope. Um, so we're, we're still, I don't want to make it, I don't want to add to the hype already, all right? So, and hopefully, yeah, down the road that everybody will have access, I mean, that's what we hope for. All right. Or come to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably come anyway. <laughs> Thank you both so much for that. We're gonna open up now to, to the audience, to you, for your questions. There's a mic in the middle, and we're gonna ask you to come to the mic to ask your question. We're also going to ask you to make sure that your question is a question and not a statement, OK? Um, so let's go. Want to hear? Wow. Oh, lots, lots of questions here. Can All you right. have more coffee? <laughs> <laughs>
kidding. And we're going to ask you to state your name as well before you ask your question. My name is Alyssa Goodman. I'm another science director at Radcliffe, but this is not a planted question. <laughs> um, uh, my question is, uh, you said, Jonathan, that this is not like computers. Mac uh, pointed out in her introduction and in my conversations with her is that the big deal about CRISPR-Cas9 ca is that it is programmable. And I'm just curious if, if I was going to play devil's advocate, if what you're saying uh, about, you know, maybe this isn't really for everyone and it's too expensive per dose, et cetera, it sounds a lot like what people said about when Bill Gates said things about personal computers. And now we have this incredible uh, open source, very modular software environment where people make solutions very, very cheaply and very individualized solutions. And so I'm just curious whether you and Sylvain and Charmaine see a future where um, personalized medicine is sort of programmable, iterative, very personalized, and somewhat safe, hopefully, medicine. Is that possible? Um, so I'll, I'll start. Uh, so, so you, you know, you raise important points. I mean, so this, uh, for example, the Mila case, I mean, in principle, academic hospitals can produce oligonucleotides that are customized for particular mutations. So, so in principle, there are different kind of production paradigms that we can think about, and, and I think it's, it is an important uh, consideration. Um, I do think that, nevertheless, we're still stuck with major challenges in terms of delivery of these techniques, uh, in terms of being able to achieve the expression levels uh, that we need uh, if we're correcting a particular gene, that we can up the expression level. Uh, you know, in the case of neurodegenerative disorders, uh, you know, uh, some of the cases that have been success, successful stories are cases where, again, the physiology is kind of on our side. You don't need to have full diffusion into the brain, you know, all the tissues of the brain, the spinal cord is sufficient, et cetera. So, so I think, again, we're sort of stuck of working against biology. Uh, and the other thing also is we're still stuck with these issues about really demonstrating efficacy and safety in populations and really having good grounds, not only for believing the risks are worth it, but also that it's worth reimbursing these. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I take your point, and I think it is a... Uh, you know, I, I think it's conceivable that there are niche areas, niche kinds of diseases for which we can have academic laboratories that are producing these oligonucleotides. Harder for me to imagine that's going to be scaled up to apply for the kinds of prevalent disorders that we're stuck with and that we're going to have good evidence to suggest that's worth doing. Thanks. Yeah, I, I agree. Delivery will always going to be an issue. And so I think if you want to do personalized medicine to mass uh, people like today, I think you have more chance with microbiome or foods to, to, to change right. than, than, than CRISPR-Cas9, that's for sure. I want to ask about uh, sort of international rogue uses of CRISPR. Dr. Hay in China, of course, uh, the expectation that a Russian scientist who, who claims that he's going to do the same kind of uh, way preliminary intervention in human gene line, um, germ line. Um, so, question mark, is there anything that can be done other than sort of international pressure from governments and scientists? Is the, how, how does one control kind of excess, rogue, preliminary, dangerous uses? That's a great question. It's, it's hard to find, I mean, mad scientists are everywhere. Right? <laughs> there are people are. that you can't control. Uh, so, but I, I like to think that there's not that many. And, and what happened in China, I mean, his career is over. I mean, so I think if people start doing that, their career will be over right now. So that's one, one, one issue. Um, yeah, that's the main issue, I think. Um, I don't think we can stop people doing anything, but I, I, I think, um, and also sometimes, you know, if you're, you're parents and, and you, you know, emotion takes over, and, and, and it's hard. Um, and, and, pe and if parents wants to do that, and, and then you've got a scientist that is willing, it's hard to block that. But you would hope that this, a scientist would, or a doctor will actually tell them that it's very risky, and there's a lot of it, ethics concerns that we need to think about that. Uh, and so, yeah. It's not an easy question. It's really not. And, um, I'm sure we'll talk about this at lunch or at break. Yeah.
Yes. Hi, um, my name is Elizabeth Guckenheimer, and I want to thank the panel and also Radcliffe for all the science conferences. Um, my question is actually a follow-up from a previous conference. Um, you didn't touch on gene drives to eliminate vectors of diseases. So, for example, mosquitoes and all the mosquito-borne diseases and ticks and Lyme disease. Um, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. That's me, right? No. <laughs> well, I'll, go, I'll, go. I'll just say that it's not an area that I consider myself sufficiently expert on to say anything intelligent. So uh, I'm going I'm to let Sylvain take the Oh, oh lovely. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I also I'm not, really not. But it's a, good, it's a very good question. I mean, yeah. ca should we modify mosquitoes? And, 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 and if we start removing insects or we start removing, what's going to replace it, right? Uh, and what's going to happen there? It's a very complex question. And we actually see that in our field. What, what's happening is so. We're, we're studying a phage, interaction with phage and bacteria, right? So we're having bacteria now that are resistant to phage, thanks to CRISPR. So we're, we're, and then we're putting this out there in the field, in the foods, for example, because that's what we, so it, just to set back a little bit here. So when you make cheese, you make yogurt, you've got bacteria inside of your, because the, these are the good bacteria. Phage are found in milk, they're naturally found there. So sometimes when you taste your cheese, your cheese doesn't taste great because phage have killed the good bacteria. You don't have the flavor development. So that's a, a process problem. So to solve that, you use CRISPR. It's a natural system, and then we can make the bacteria resistant to phage. So we're doing that. It's great. So what happened is that when we start putting those strains out there, we're killing the phage that are causing issue, but new phage are coming up something we have never seen before. They're fine, they're phage, but they're different. So in the gene drive scenario, what's gonna happen if we start removing insects and what's gonna take over? That's, that's a, a question, really. So I, I don't know that, yeah. All right, thank you, next. Hello, oh, sorry. Um, my name's Ermia Samuel. I'm just a high school student who's interested in CRISPR. Oh, great. Um, my question is, I know that CRISPR-Cas9 has been successful in editing different organisms, such as mice and even in the agriculture field. But in terms of human gene editing, I want to know, I know that there isn't, there isn't exactly a blueprint and it's not 100% accurate to fix genes in humans, such as diseases and such. But how will scientists ensure a better oversight in gene editing in the future? I mean, I, I can start, I mean, this is a little bit, your question is a question that in some ways is similar to a question that was raised, you know, uh, by uh, two people ago. Um, in terms of oversight of human studies, we do have ethics committees that, you know, review that, uh, regulatory bodies, et cetera. So I don't necessarily see it being too much different, the oversight of that, uh, in terms of, you know, again, the human studies. But again, we have this phenomenon of, potentially rogue actors, and I guess I would echo Sylvan's point. Uh, it's hard in a large world uh, that's uh, riven by all sorts of different forces uh, to uh, ensure that you have absolute sort of, you know, uh, uniformity in terms of adherence to whatever international policies there are. What I can say is you, you can make it really, really hard for people to do these kinds of things by making it very difficult for them to advance their careers. So just as a quick example, uh, many times people want to use these techniques because they want to be the first one to do them and they want to get the scientific notoriety. They want to get a paper into Nature or one of those single named you know, <laughs> journals. I love that, I love that line. Um, and those journals now will typically require ethical review of manuscripts before they accept them. And if a study has been done inconsistent with international consensus or guidelines, they'll reject them. And so it gets much harder to advance your career by stepping out of line with what our you know, global consensus on, on policy. So I see that as kind of one of the main vehicles by which you can make it really, really hard to do that kind of thing. I'd also add to that quickly by saying that scientists also have the responsibility to, to let others know about other scientists they know who are, who are going rogue, right? Um, when Dr. Hay was doing his, his work, there are some scientists who knew or who had some inkling of what was going on. Some didn't even know who to go to talk with, right? Um, so, so scientists 
having responsibility for more than just their own science, but for the field as a whole and for being bold um, in speaking out when they, when they know things are going on on the ground. Um, some scientists are more likely to do that than others, but I think all scientists need to take on that responsibility. And by the way, that's great that a high school student is here. Yes, really a, absolutely. And, and, uh, <laughs> And that's another reason why it's so great to have CRISPR-Cas9 discussions because it, it raised the interest in high school students and that we do really need that. We have more high school students interested in science. So, yes. and, and actually it's funny because there's a lot of, a lot of um, it's not funny, it's great. There's a lot of um, schools that are introducing CRISPR-Cas9 or CRISPR-Cas into their curriculum. So students, undergrad students are doing CRISPR-Cas uh, uh, experiments, which I think is, is also yes. great. Great comment there, mm. so far, yes. I'm Malia Marrero, I'm a neurologist in Moncton, Canada, working on rare diseases and precision medicine in our new center. We have a lot of Canadians around here. <laughs> <laughs> My question is beyond uh, therapy for genetically determined diseases. I, I'm, I'm talking about what is your take on disease prevention, in particular concerning, for instance, yeah. factors like gut flora, environmental uh, factors for conditions that are killing our people more, like obesity or maybe autoimmune diseases, multiple sclerosis, for instance. We know there is a link, and we can modify the flora positively to prevent those conditions from developing the symptoms, basically. Okay, cool. um, so that's a bit outside CRISPR-Cas9 in a way, isn't it? Um, necessarily. Well, I, I think the gut flora is clearly part of our I mean, we need to take care of that, that's for sure. And there's so many microorganisms there. Uh, the viral population in our gut microflora is, is we need to know what's in there. Um, and, and it's clearly, again, playing, I was trying to say that viruses are controlling bacterial populations. So every time you find bacteria, you'll find viruses. How can we dom domesticate that to understand how phage or viruses and bacteria are interacting together? That's clearly part of the personalized medicine thing that's going to happen sometimes down the road. Um, CRISPR-Cas9 in that area, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, maybe I missed that, that part, but I... CRISPR is for, for instance, in your area of work, can modify bacteria in the Oh, gut. I see, yeah, yeah, okay. And those bacteria, for instance, the ones like what we, we have been Sorry. seeing in multiple sclerosis, like bravimeterno bacteria, they can actually be linked to causality in some studies, and if we modify them, we probably prevent the disease. Okay, we're okay. gonna have to move on, because we're, we, we're running short on time, and we wanna make sure we get everybody. So right, no follow-up questions. Quick. Just the question and the answer. All right. All right. So first of all, hello. My name is Aperva Joshi, and I am also a high school student. Wow. <laughs> and specifically, I'm interested in the intersection between machine learning and how it can be used to optimize gene editing technologies like CRISPR-Cas9. So my question is for Professor Kimmelman. And in your discussion, you talked about the developmental timeline. So I'm curious to see your thoughts on using machine learning and neural networks in order to better predict the kinds of gene technologies we and like their specific applications and what effect do you think that would have on the development of timeline you mentioned? Okay, thanks. Um, so, <laughs> so, no, no, I, I, maybe that came thanks, out wrong. But no, thanks. <laughs> no, uh, you know, it probably won't surprise people in this audience to know that I'm also a bit of a skeptic about the whole machine learning thing. <laughs> You know, uh, machine learning is great if you have really, really reliable data that you can put into your algorithm. And I think uh, it's really challenging collecting really, really good, reliable data to feed into those algorithms. Uh, the other challenge with machine learning, obviously, is you can't, often it's really hard to peer under the hood and to understand what those algorithms are doing and whether they really make sense and what kind of assumptions are built into them. So, so I, I actually think that, um, you know, uh, I'm just a bit of a skeptic about uh, how much machine, I'm sure again, there'll be niche applications to, you know, to be sure, particularly in areas like diagnostics. Uh, I'm just not sure uh, that machine learning is gonna solve the big problems of taking a basic principle and developing a useful intervention for it uh, that's gonna work in populations of human beings. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Joel Heller, uh, I'm not a high school student. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Yeah, I have a question about the uh, business model for uh, CRISPR. It, it seems like it's a technique and not like a drug that you're developing. And so um, the access uh, could be just like a, a lab person and a doctor. And uh, so how, do, how does that work? In, in, you know, in a global sense and as far as patents go. I, I can take a stab at that. Um, so I, again, it depends on what applications we're, we're talking about, but if you have to deliver something with a vector, I assume that the vector is gonna have intellectual property around it, so if you have to package it in a sort of AEV virus or something, uh, so there's gonna be IP around that. Uh, you know, if you're talking oligosense, you know, oligonucleotides, there may be particular chemistry around the uh, nucleotide sequence that has intellectual property. And I think one thing that we have to remember, again, if we look at the history, you know, look at the innovation in medicine, you know, you don't just invent something and you just use it for 20 years exactly as it is. You look at medical devices, they always have these kind of incremental changes that bring a little bit more value added. And by the way, they also give you new intellectual property patents that, you know, that you can extend. So, so I think it's, it's, you know, it's a little bit enticing to think that maybe we have just, uh, we put it into a program and spits out an oligonucleotide and we use that in patients. But I think the reality is that the way the innovation proceeds, there's always gonna be uh, some space for protecting the intellectual, uh, intellectual property around whatever the sort of cutting edge uh, techniques that we're using. But maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, oh, that's, that's my right. sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, thank you. Yeah. Next question. Hello. Hello. My name's Mikey. Unfortunately, I am another high school student. <laughs> <laughs> Not unfortunate at all. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm specifically interested in how like genetic technologies like CRISPR-Cas9 could be used to solve global problems like climate change. Mm -hmm. So a question for you, um, Sylvan, you're studying like the coevolution between these phages and the bacteria which is incredibly complex. I mean, you have CRISPR and then you have anti-CRISPR. So right. I guess another, <laughs> another question about how computing innovation is gonna come into play with this. Are you guys finding yourself working more with computer scientists to aid in this process? Or do you think like quantum supremacy reached by Google, do you think that's like an over hype? Yeah, so great questions. Great high schools around here. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, indeed. So climate change is one thing. Um, obviously, if crops is one thing that's really clear. I mean, we need to improve crops if, you know, if uh, global warming, um, because of global, global warming, so CRISPR-Cas9 is definitely uh, uh, a technology we can use to improve crops. Um, and, and I was just reading recently that I think there's so many patents in agriculture related to CRISPR-Cas, it's not even better, there's more even more patent in the agriculture side than there is in human health. So there's a lot, so that's definitely going to be an issue in the sense that people are gonna study this. Um, and, and plant science, you gotta also think about this. So when you do, for example, you wanna change a crop, so there was different people who were using different technologies, that were, I mean, you don't wanna know what they were using. But it was really, really complicated and it was a error, error trial base, right? And now we've got this technology where you can do your, your, your modification and then you, you can almost be sure that you get your plant after a couple of months. Before that, you were not even sure. You know, you would do your modification randomly and then you get and try to see if this would work. And now you've got this technology where you're gonna get your plant. For sure you're gonna get it. And then you can study it. And then you can ask quite research questions that are totally different today than five years ago before the technology was there. So in the plant science, CRISPR-Cas9 has changed totally how you do research because you're gonna can do this much faster. So in terms of climate change, definitely uh, it's going to have an impact. Now in terms of, of bioinformatician, yeah, we, we work with them all the time. I mean, uh, yeah, because <laughs> I don't understand. Uh, no, seriously, they, they're really, this is definitely, and I think we're seeing more and more people that are, have interest in, in computer, have also degrees in biology, and, and then their understanding um, both sides is, is fantastic. And there's more and more bioinformatician. And I come from a department that teach biochemistry. Actually, when I arrived at my department, we were a biochem department. A couple of years later, we became a biochem and microbiology department. And now we are biochem, micro, and bioinformatics. <laughs> so clearly, it's really a good field to go to, into. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. 
Hi, my name is Chris Shi. I'm also a high school student Talk. and interested in the um, sort of intersection between uh, computer-aided uh, genome analysis and gene editing there. Uh, my question is about the sort of economics regarding this and like how, given the sort of unscale inherent unscalability, as you mentioned, of personalized medicine and personalized gene editing, how do you, do you think that it'll ever get to the point where like the prices can come down, where it's up open to like the average consumer? Because like, because you can only apply a specific therapy to a small subset, like will the prices ever come down? The pricing is not related to the technology the pr because doing CRISPR-Cas9 is not expensive. What is expensive is the clinical trial that goes with it and finding the right delivery div vehicle like John was mentioning uh, because you know treating a blindness or treating a liver disease or treating a blood disease is not the same delivery. Uh, so in the clinical try to make sure that there's, this is safe, uh, that's where it's costing. I don't think this is going to go down though. I, I'd be very surprised, but yeah, I don't know. But it, like a research tool, that's why so many people are using it. It's not very expensive. You just need to, when you buy the Cas9, the vector, you just need to change the guide RNA, which is very cheap. So to do this in a lab, it's not very expensive. But to, to expand that to for treat somebody, you got safety issues, so you need clinical trials. Or I guess I was wondering about like a different process, because right now you have to go through a similar process to clinical trials for each individual like operation. But now, given that like you're thinking about doing a different one for every person. Is there another process that could be implemented now? Okay. I don't know. So we're gonna, so we'll no, follow up with him later. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> we have to, thank you so much for your question. We're gonna try to make, have everyone ask their questions. So we need to move along. Next uh, question, please. Hi, my name is Mukund and I'm another high schooler passionate about personalized medicine and structure-based drug design. So in current like target-based drug design, you have to screen like billions of molecules, then do lead optimization. And I know that process takes like a super long time and costs a lot of money. So if we're thinking about the uses of CRISPR in the long term, uh, wouldn't it benefit and s benefit us and save a lot of money from this process? Because instead of going through like an integrated proteomics, transcriptomics, genomics approach, we're going directly to the genes and editing them. So we wouldn't have to go through all the ligand receptor analysis and save a lot of time there. So there are CRISPR screens going on right now. So you can, Cas9, you can modify it. You can make it to go bind something and not cut. So you can play with expression of genes and production of proteins. So there, you can design like thousands of guide RNA and do screens to look for targets. Um, so what you're, you're trying to say is there's some of that going on already. Uh, so it's not, yeah. All right, yeah. thank you. But it's a great, it's a great point, yeah. All right, last question. Oh, she's, oh, oh, wow, well, okay. We're That's done. Amy. <laughs> That's, That's Amy, all right. That is the key. Okay. Um, Thank I'd you like, all so much. I'm time. sorry. Charmaine, I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank you, Savan and Jonathan. Uh, they truly set the tone for the day, which is to really strike the right balance, if we can, between the innovations, the discoveries, and the ethics, and the economics. So with that, I'd like to uh, uh, suggest a break, uh, actually take a break, not even a suggestion, and there's coffee in the back, and there are bathrooms on the first floor and downstairs. Thank you. Okay. Oh, please be back at 11. Bye.